<laughs> clap it, clap it after your coffee cup. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Clap it, clap it. Hey everybody, welcome to Here's Out. I'm Patrick. And I'm Paul. And this time around we're talking about movie tropes. Movie tropes that we love or hate. Uh, mostly, I think, just movie tropes that we hate. Because uh, we're like that. So uh, join us on this journey, why don't you? Uh, don't forget, we release movies every Tuesday and Thursday. Movies every uh, Tuesday and Thursdays, uh, 8, a, 8 p.m. GMT. Yeah, and sometimes they're just episodes, but if you think of them as little movies, then we're going to have to up our production. Well, <laughs> well. We, always, we always should shoot for the moon. Shoot for the moon. Because then if we don't hit the moon, we hit the sky. Oh, that's a beautiful way to... Is that, did you get that from a greeting card? I got that from some movie. Hey! So what's a movie trope? A movie trope is something that you see all the time in movies, something that happens, a conceit, um, a setup, or whatever it might be, that is repeatedly used, or as we're about to discuss, overused. Mm. It's one of those things, I think the easiest way to, to identify with what we're about to talk about is keep listening, because I guarantee you one of these you've either noticed or you're going to notice it now and be annoyed about it forever. So sorry in advance for ruining movies. I'm going to start with a car one. To go faster... In a car, in a movie, you change gear. You change gear again to go even faster. And let's say you need a little bit of speed. You change gear again. It is not how cars work uh, necessarily. Technically it is, but you don't have 18 gears in most cars. That's You're thinking bicycles and trucks for that. Uh, Fast and Furious is a great example of uh, that great director's moment of, oh, we got we got to amp this up. Will we show the flame coming out of an exhaust? Oh no, he needs to go faster and it's got to be the actor doing it. Change gear. Uh, yeah, I think they had like 18 or 20 gear changes in a straight line drag race at one point. Yeah. So if he was changing down gears while trying to go faster, that that's not how it works. So um, yeah, that one, that one's well documented. And uh, as a kind of like, I don't know, a uh, prefix to that one, um, screaming also to go faster like you've already gone to your top speed and then for some strange reason your scream makes it go that little bit faster look machines have like set you know parameters of how fast they go and stuff like that yeah you know you add on to that when they're going downhill or something screaming is not a factor there's no engineer who's going like you know where there's the screaming factor well can the guy on engineering explained maybe just draw that up on a whiteboard and go well you see when you scream you create a shock wave forward <laughs> and, and technically you'll gain 0 0.01 of, no uh screaming does make a lot of things better uh, like concerts and other things, but it does not make you go faster. No, no, it doesn't. Uh, you actually came up with one that was kind of uh, car related also, and that's... That's uh, finding the keys in the uh, sun visor. You know, every time it's just like, like an Independence Day when they find a fire truck on the side of the road and they, they check around and then for some strange reason the fire truck's keys are just in the sun visor or in Terminator or in a whole host of other movies. It's just, what's, what's wrong with, is, is, it, is this because car manufacturers don't like you hot wiring their cars? Because if that's the th reason, then someone's got to say that. Right. But like also, and I know, okay, everybody's going to be, well, this is going away now because of keyless entry and blah, blah, blah. Yeah. But for years, it's been the pull down the visor, grab the keys and away you go. You pointed out also the Terminator 2. It became such a thing in the film that uh, the Terminator learned because it had happened so many times. Yeah. This is not one of those things that ever really happened in real life. Comment down below if you say, oh, we always left another set of keys in the visor of our unlocked car. Which, because we don't have pockets, they weren't invented until after the automobile. Yeah. It's just weird. It makes no sense at all. And uh, I'm glad that it's actually going away because it always sort of bugged me. Yeah. And yeah, it was, it was weird. If anybody wants to school us on why that, where that came from or how it was a, a custom in a particular town that you grew up in, let us know because I want to go and joyride for a while in all the cars <laughs> of that town. <laughs> Um, in other uh, relation to to that, uh, guns being something that you're better with than me, I, I bring the car, he brings the ammo. Uh, Overcocking of weapons to be either intimidation or show that the action is about to go off. If you count the amount of times that someone cocks a, cocks a, like, cocks a gun, it's just like, okay, well, see, you've shot it and now you've cocked it, which means that the gun has already loaded a bullet in there. And when you cock it, you're just unloading that bullet and loading another one in. 
So you're not doing anything except for wasting your fucking ammo, you know? Or you're increasing the possibility of a jam. So it's just like, stop like stop doing it with shotguns and stop doing it with pistols, all right? So do it once. Or just, because like, if you've got guns on your set, you definitely have a guy, like a, a weapons, like a, an arms master or something like that who knows them. And if you see him go, it's obviously that you're over cocking or doing something stupid. So let's and, kind of leave it out. And okay, don't get us wrong. We know, we understand movies. We understand movie magic. We understand the idea of it's not all real uh, suspension of disbelief. But these are tropes. They're unnecessarily used um, to the extreme in some cases. Two little ones, but I'm not going to like bring them up to that's too much. Right. It's the uh, it's the last bullet, the last magic bullet, which is like you know, oh, you've one bullet and you have not been doing great with like your rest of your shots, but for some reason, because everything is hindering on this one bullet, <laughs> marksman all of a sudden, yeah, and, top shot, uh, and then the the uh, is the the whole click thing, you know, when you're empty on the perfect moment that you're empty, and then the 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 uh, bulletproof vest. Oh yeah, thing, where you just know that a character isn't dead because of their bulletproof vest. Yeah. That's not how bulletproof vests work, people. Also, the percentage of your body covered when somebody is spraying you, or more likely, forty people are spraying you with bullets, and it's like, oh, it's okay. I just got hit once in the vest. It's like you should have got hit four hundred times in the head alone, buddy. Um, to just to continue on the bullet theme, it's nothing to do with guns. It's to do with getting the bullet back out of people. This is what this is what made me want to talk about this, because you've all seen it. There's a little uh, silver dish and a pair of silver tweezers. I'm using a silver pen. So you take the bullet out and then make that dink noise in every bullet extraction in TV or cinema. That's fine in a hospital. How many times is it, oh, I'm a criminal. You can't bring me to the hospital. Bring me to a vet's lab. Fine. Vets might have these things also. But it's when it's, oh, I'm a criminal and, you know, I'm just going to go to this farmhouse and I'm going to, you're going to have to cut out the bullet with garden shears. You know, there's a tractor that I'm going to lie across while you do this. The person cuts them open with, with shears, gets the bullet out with tweezers that have just magically showed up and then drop them in the perfect little sterilized tin, which obviously we all know, ask a farmer right beside your tractor, your Massey Ferguson or your Ford. That's where you keep the little surgical uh, tray. Yeah, it's the most clean place you possibly can. On a oh, farm. yeah, well, respect to farmers. I, I love that you uh, keep that strange combination of equipment on hand at all times. Now, linking with farmers in the most loosely fashioned way. I don't uh, know where he's going. This is cool. It's the, uh, you talked about it, it's the hunger and starvation. Oh, yeah. Go for yeah. it. Yeah, that's the loosest way I could bring that one up. <laughs> loosest way ever. Uh, if you're in a desert... And uh, you're starving and thirsty and stuff like that. You might think that when you find the precious water bottle or the precious water, you might not want to just sprinkle it over your goddamn self, you know, or the sandwich where the half of the it's you're not a muppet, all right? Mm. You're not like a cookie monster eating a cookie, like you know, please, you know, savor the moment and, and eat everything. Yeah, it, it, it's really, really annoying. So I haven't seen water for six weeks. I've been cr- traveling across the desert. I mean, I poured most of it on the side of my face and a little bit went into my mouth. That That's just, it. it's unnecessarily annoying, dramatic. But I just noticed uh, I've been miming almost all of these and I don't know why. I'm going to stop now. But please comment down below if you noticed before I did and thought, why is why is that one miming everything they say? Is that what you're trying to? Are you trying to get like to the to the? Is it, if this doesn't work out, you're trying to like pitch your mime. Yeah, this is going to be added to your profile of my backup career is going to be uh, Marcel Marceau uh, standing for the resurgence of mime. <laughs> what was that last one? I, did, I was only cut dragging, it, dragging a rope. Oh right, okay. I, I um I wish mine was segueing into something, but it's not because we're just gonna go. Ooh. Do you really think the drinking one really linked to the farming one that well? Uh, you know what? I'm gonna give it to you. You you had an idea. You 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 shot for the moon and you hit. <laughs> you hit six or seven feet away from where you took off from, and I'm with you on that journey. Um, I'm gonna move it straight on to trains, Paul, because when you said this, I loved it. What happens? Fights happen on trains. Not in trains. I'm miming again. <laughs> I was I was wondering if you were noticing Ooh. that. So, uh, yeah, it's it's kind of weird. A lot of uh, a lot of train scenes and stuff like that. There's uh, there's 
there's a, a lot of the whole thing where it's just like, no, nope, I don't want to be inside this train anymore because it's the most convenient place for me to be. I'm going to... Oh, it's it's just an umpty ante kind of thing, which yeah. I can understand in certain respects, but like when you're like in uh, Sherlock Holmes, uh, the Shadow uh, game of Shadow. Oh yeah, the second Sherlock Holmes. Yeah, um, they they move outside the thing so they can get behind people, and it's just like that makes sense. But like they're trying to escape, and you're just like you're on the roof of a train, mate. Where are you escaping to? Are you escaping to the other roof of the carriage? I don't know, like you know. Is there a helicopter on the other roof? Is that what's because I can't see one. Well, you know? it's it's obviously the safest place to be on a train is outside of it, hanging onto it in some way. Yeah, because we haven't had decapitations from no. like speed or you know being no. punched off or this the fucking host well, of shit. That's the thing. Once you see a train, you're like, there's a fifty fifty chance we're going to end up hanging off the side of it or on top of it. Mm-hmm. Once somebody's on top of it there's a 50-50 chance that the fight is going to result in one of them being thrown off it or being hit by an object that is at the height of the roof of the train. That's why that's a movie trope that maybe could just, you know, get a first-class ticket the hell out of here because it's annoying. Oh, very good. To see what he did. I stopped mime and I went straight into puns. This isn't going the right direction. This is weird. Um, on the But look at my... So I watched this for a little link. What do trains have? For a segue. Trains have doors. Because uh, also doors on buses and trains. You ever notice that? The perfect getaway. I know where you're going with this. Yeah, like that, for a second, I was just like, I don't remember this being on the... And then, yeah, yeah, yeah. We're so prepared that we're surprising each other with each other's ideas. Um, yeah, running running away. When you're running away from somebody, you see that you're on the subway platform. The train is there. The doors are closing. You sneak in. Yeah, get in just before the person that's chasing you. And all of a sudden, you're magically, that's it. You're completely safe. Because trains and buses don't pull away that fast when the doors close all the time. So whoever is following you, if they have a gun, I, I don't know about where you live in the world, but we live in Ireland, no bulletproof buses that we know of. Actually, yeah. I've, well, no. I'm, I'm calling uh, the Irish bus people. Yeah, so w- what's with that trope? Why is it like, oh, I'm so safe now? Do you know when you're a kid and you run to like the den okay no yeah. like you're just like you're being chased and you run to like the base or something yeah, you're just yeah, like yeah. Oh, I'm safe and the person's just standing there going like oh you got to the fence yeah and I, I actually you know what you're it's right it's exactly like that and I have never realised that the mafia KGB uh, hitmen cartels uh, Yakuza everybody who's ever chased somebody in a film probably do live by those oh, rules oh yeah no you yeah. have to it's also also you know you could also when they when they hit you you can also hit them back and then they're still on so you oh, can yeah, yeah. Away. no backsies no backsies yeah. um, also I licked it so that's you know that's another one you know <laughs> the Yakuza are very important about that one uh, I'm going to throw in because we're we're probably running along I'm going to throw in a couple really really quick and I'm I'm going to consult the list again uh, I had one that I just wanted to throw in there really really quickly ever since Jurassic Park if there's a dinosaur film you're going to have a dinosaur backlit by something like the moon or uh, there'll be a there'll be a moment where it roars and the camera catches it with the perfect scene behind it because they need their poster image and that is like ah just maybe just one film don't do it it'll make me happy I know I'm a curmudgeonly old man um, but that leaves us with two left, which is, as we have written them down, Magic Juice, oh, three left, which we're going to finish on that, I think. Magic Juice and not getting answers at visiting time. So I would like to start with visiting time. If you ever watch, uh, what was it, Umbrella Academy, I think that it's, there's a really good example of this in that. Uh, you're the FBI. You're questioning a suspect who's been taken to hospital. They're in the private room. You're with your partner. You're like, do you know this man? Is this the man who planted the bomb? And they're like, yeah, yeah. And the nurse comes in and goes, okay, visiting time's over. You have to leave. And they're like, oh, no, no, but we just have one more question. You don't even have one more question. You're just like, hang on. They're about to answer this one question, which ends this entire charade. But they're like, no, no, okay, we'll we'll come back. Visiting time's over. Because obviously we just shot a load of people unlawfully, more than likely. Uh, but we respect visiting errors in hospitals because we're very, very polite. 
yeah, so the second one of that is the the magic juice or wake up juice, which is like this person is in a coma or like unconscious and they're just like, Well, we need to talk to them and they're just like, Okay, well let me just get this syringe of wake up stuff oh, and they're just l- like allow me to mime that for you. Sorry. <laughs> but they're like, uh, we should like, you know, you only be conscious for a couple of seconds. It's like medically speaking, if they're unconscious and you're forcing them awake, the body does things to to protect itself. So forcing them awake to answer your questions, it's just like, it's probably going to kill them. And like, I understand that they're a bad guy, you know, but you still kind of killed someone or kind of put them in a lot of pain or something like that, you know? Well, there's there's a couple of possible outcomes there, you know? Uh, maybe you hit them with the wake-up juice and they wake up and answer all your questions. Maybe you hit them with the wake-up juice and they're dead. And then the nurse or doctor is like, Thank you. I've now lost my medical license. <laughs> or or they hit them with a wake-up juice. You ask them the question, and then the nurse comes in and goes, well, visiting times are over. Sorry, sorry, guys. <laughs> you you, you got to go. Well, we only just gave them the wake-up juice. Yeah, yeah, but visiting time, eight to eight, you know, and I'm a civil servant, and I'm really sticking for the, for the rules. That's great. Although there is there is the, the real version of it. Hit them with the wake-up juice, and then the detective has to stand there well, this person's bodily functions all freak out. So the witness starts farting and burping and doing God knows what. And the nurse is just like looking at them going, I told you this wasn't going to be good. Yeah. No, just don't do it. Or you're just like, we need him to wake up. It's like, well, we don't have, there's nothing in this world that wakes up a co- person in a coma. Otherwise, we use it all the goddamn time. That's a very good point, actually. If you just have the juice to wake people up, then surely zap zap. Well, I guess there's a difference between a natural coma and a and a chemical induced coma. Yeah, people in natural ones don't have answers for MacGuffin, the FBI agent who needs it. And I what's MacGuffin. I, I I want an FBI agent called MacGuffin to do that scene because that's all they are at that point. Um, I'm going to throw this over to Paul to close it out because this is the trope to end all tropes. It's the one that you all definitely recognise because you've all seen a famous film or TV series that this is epitomized by. Paul. I have a thing about engineers asking for more time than they need. It's it's kind of a two-way thing. It's kind of like it's like an engineer in a sci-fi going, we need, well, we need nine hours to fix the engines. And then the captain going, we have six. And like the engineer is just like, that's actually how much I need it. Like, or do no. captains not also understand the fact that like, these are giant complex machines that possibly will need that amount of time and jury rigging them so that they work a few hours before you they, they would be fully functioning again is a good idea. It's kind of like the wake up juice, actually. Now that I'm it, thinking it's about the it, wake up juice for a machine. It's just like if the professionals are like, it's probably not a good idea. You should probably go. Yeah, it's probably not a good idea. They have spent their entire life figuring this shit out. Yeah, we, we need to have that car fixed for for 12 tomorrow when you know the buyer is coming that's it we need to fix this it's going to take x hours and we have x minus one hours i'm getting math into this because like i get i get that there's a slight poor purpose the way that it's like you know you've uh nine hours and it's like you got six and it's just like do you not think that they were working like as hard as they possibly can for the nine hours were you just like uh, well, they'll probably take like half an hour break in the middle of that. So if I take that away, then we've got, you know, eight and a half hours. And then like John is a real, like John's a real shit for like, you know, not doing this proper work. So we'll cut another hour and a half off that. You know, is he just dwindling around because he has a shit crew <laughs> or is it, you know? Yeah. It's just weird. It annoys me. And look, again, I'm going to say this just before we close out. We know that this is all about suspension of disbelief. And we really are just shouting into the wind right now. But you know what you should do? Try it. It's great fun. Shout into the wind sometime. It just, it's a release. Um, I, I've learned so much in this video. I've learned I'm into mime. Didn't know it. Um, I've learned Paul associates farmers and like, I'm not even. Farmers in desert. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm not even not psychologically unpacking that one. That's for your Drought therapist to do. It directly approach it. There, there you go. There you go. Roll it back. Way to think on your feet. <laughs> <laughs> um, and on that note, let us know what tropes you love or hate. Uh, let us know uh, anything else you'd like to see. Like, subscribe, comment, share. Uh, we do videos on Tuesdays and Thursdays. Come back, check us out. If you're on our YouTube channel right now, hit that video section. Have a browse around. You might find some of our old stuff. Has me miming in it also. Yeah.
So, I've been Paul. I've been Patrick. And we've been Hear Us Out. Chat to you later. Oh no, we're on the TV. Help us. There's a dude miming in our... <laughs> oh, he's like... That's um, me. He's like, uh, Paul's doing a lot of... Oh, wait, no, I'm sitting on that side. Hang on, Paul's talking and there's a guy beside him miming. Who's that dude? So yeah, even my... Oh, I 